preparing my talk, I looked at the list of participants, and I realized that many of you are architects. I thought, oh my goodness, how am I going to connect what I do to architecture? And the best I could come up with was the first slide here, which is an artist's rendition of an extrasolar planet that maybe has some intelligent life on it. And I began to think, well, think of all the opportunities for building cities on these, on these planets that I discover. Of course, many of these planets will have gravity stronger than the Earth, so we're going to need architects to design things that are much stronger. I began to wonder, what would, what would your structures look like if the Earth's gravity were suddenly doubled? Would you be OK with that? Of course, you probably all build you know, factors of 10 safety factors into all your designs, so none of you would be worried about that, right? OK, well, there are three questions that basically have framed most of my 30 years of professional astronomical research. And they're captured here in this famous painting by Paul Gauguin. And the three questions are, where do we come from? What or who are we? And where are we going? And these are questions that probably all of us, at one time or another, have sort of asked ourselves. It's a fairly human thing to do that, to figure out what our place is in this universe. So the first question, <clears throat> where do we come from, has been largely answered, I think, through astronomical research over particularly the past 50 years or so. Uh, we understand pretty well the origin of the universe, whether it came from something or not, we don't know. But we know about 13 billion years ago, the Big Bang formed and it started off our universe. And uh, within um, about the first three minutes of the Big Bang, uh, the basic constituents of the atoms were, were put together, the protons and the neutrons and electrons. And then about 400,000 years after that, the, uh, the universe cooled enough so that the protons and the electrons could get together into hydrogen atoms. And at that point, the, the energy and the matter decoupled and we ended up with a matter-dominated universe. And very quickly out of that, uh, stars formed. The first generations of stars formed. At that point, we basically only had pretty much hydrogen and helium in the entire universe. There was not, no other kind of atoms around. And out of those first generations and second generations of stars, all the other atoms of the periodic table were formed, all the way on up from carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, to all the, the, the elements that are formed that, that we know of in the periodic table. And, and then successor generations of stars formed out of that material. Our sun was one of those stars. And the detritus or the debris that was left over in the disk of the formation of the sun, uh, out of that coalesced uh, uh, planetesimals, rocky, basically rocks and grains of sand and such, and quickly formed planets. And one of those planets was the Earth. And that is the platform upon which evolution worked as magic and, and gave rise to life. So the answer to where we came from is pretty much, quite simply, from the stars. We came from the stars. We are, as Carl Sagan would say, star stuff. And um, that's kind of my answer, at least, to the first part of that question. And that was 50 to 100 years of really hard work by a lot of astrophysicists. If you look out on a, on a clear, dark night, maybe even tonight you can see this. You can see the Andromeda galaxy. It's the farthest thing you can see with the naked eye. It's a very, just a faint smudge in the sky. And it's a system, it's a galaxy of about 300 billion stars. It looks very much like our own galaxy. It's kind of a, a twin sister galaxy. And we see that in this picture here through a, the veil of stars in our own galaxy. So all these stars you see up in, that are covering the field here are right in front of our nose. That's our own galaxy. And we're looking out through those stars at this island universe of galaxies, 300 billion suns or stars. But if we look deeper out into the universe at a place where you don't see anything at all with the Hubble Space Telescope, and you stare for 10 days at a time straight, you see as far as the telescopes can gather information are galaxies all the way out to the edge of the observable universe. Every one of these points of light here pretty much is a galaxy, a system of hundreds of billions of stars. So there's a lot of stars out there. And if you try to count them all, you end up with a big number. It's a number like 70,000 billion billion stars that we certainly know are there. There's probably more than that, but those are the ones we at least can see. It's literally more than all the grains of sand on all the world's beaches. A lot of places out there where you could have stars with planets around them. So that brings me to the second question, who are we? And in asking that question, it 
it begs the answer to another question, which you need to answer first, I think, in order to understand this question, and that is, are we alone? Are we completely, utterly alone in this vast universe, or are we not? And it's a fascinating question because it has an answer. And the answer is either yes or no. It's not none of the above, right? It has an answer. And either way, the answer is utterly profound. It calibrates our place in the universe. It tells us who we are. So it's a very important ingredient in the, in the, the question, who are we? is answering this question, are we alone in the universe? So what does it mean to be alone? I mean, if you're on some mega spaceship traveling out through the universe there, are you alone on that spaceship if you're with your dog? Probably not, right? You know, you're with your buddy, your dog, or your cat or something, or your cousin or whatever, you're not alone. How about if you're with a cockroach on that spacecraft? Do you feel alone? Some people maybe yes, maybe no. How about an ant? How about a mosquito? I mean, when you go to bed at night in your bedroom, there's a mosquito. Do you feel alone? Uh-uh, right? I wouldn't go to sleep until I killed that mosquito, right? <laughs> so it's not just the size of the thing, right? It's, it's other things. Well, to be perfectly crass, I think it, being alone or not means can you eat it, right? Can you make a hot dog or a hamburger out of it or eat it? But, of course, that works both ways. Can it eat you? So... I, I just couldn't resist this picture, this poor guy here in this hot dog suit at the front of the 7-Eleven. He looked very upset, so I just kind of liked that. Had to put that in there. God knows what he was doing there, but he wasn't happy. Anyway, so the kind of life that we understand, you know, carbon-based organic life, you can think of life as made out of silicon or whatever, but the kind of life that we understand is the kind of life that you could make a hamburger out of or that could do the same to you. So there's two things you have to keep in mind when you're thinking about how to find that kind of life in the universe. One is the force of gravity, which nobody escapes from. It's the force of any two masses is proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the, to the square of the distance between them. Isaac Newton taught us that. And the other is temperature. And these are two things that you cannot escape from when you begin to think about life in the universe. And in terms of temperature, the bottom of the temperature scale is zero degrees Kelvin, absolute zero. At that temperature, atoms are not even moving, and that's kind of just a theoretical temperature that, we, that is sort of the limit of, of coldness. Most of, of space, the space between the stars, is only a couple degrees warmer than that. It's about 2.7 Kelvin. So at that temperature, you're basically liquid helium. If you're a piece of DNA or something that's trying to, to make a living, replicating, and you know, turning into a creature, it's very hard because your atoms are hardly even moving at that level. Now, the, the kind of temperature ranges that we're used to are, are temperature ranges from about zero to 100 centigrade, and that's an important temperature range because that's the range in which water is in liquid form, and water is a very important catalyst for the kind of organic reactions that make life. Now, fortunately, Earth's temperature, just due to the, the, the energy coming in from the sun, is a little bit lower than that. And Earth should be just a, a ball of, of frozen ice. But fortunately, there's the greenhouse effect, and the Earth's atmosphere warms the temperature up to get most of the Earth up into this liquid water region, and that's why we have oceans and, and are able to have life sustaining. But most of space is down near 3 degrees Kelvin. So your only hope, if your life out in the universe, is to get near a star so that you can have the, the life-giving warmth and energy of the star. But then there's that gravity thing. So if you're a, a piece of DNA on a dust moat out near some, gala, some, near some star, um, you're liable to fall into the star, just like a ball will roll downhill. You'll fall right in and turn into a puff of plasma, and you won't be long for this universe. So you have to be falling around the star, and that's why orbits are magical. Orbits are, are a, a way to be near a star, but to not fall into the star. And the nice thing about orbits, most of them, is that they're very stable. And so you can be near the star enough to get the, the, the life-giving heat and life from the star without falling in. And you can do that over billions of years, the billions of years it takes to allow evolution to work its magic. So an important ingredient in this search is orbits around stars. Now, you can have many different kinds of orbits around stars. To follow life, we want to find those orbits that have liquid water. So if you're in an orbit that's too close to the star, you're too hot. 
your planet is too hot and all the water will almost immediately evaporate, boil away, and it'll be lost to space. If your orbit is too big, you'll be too cold and all your water will be in a frozen state and won't be available for chemical reactions. So we want orbits that, that have water that can exist at the, in the liquid water form, zero to 100 degrees centigrade at normal atmospheric temperatures. So we call that the habitable zone, where water can exist at zero to 100 degrees centigrade. So planets in habitable zones is what we're looking for. Now the word habitability means different things to different people, and, and my wife always gives me trouble about using this term habitable, because to her it means basically sitting out on a beach somewhere, you know, having a corona or something like that. And you know, having a corona would tend to make a planet much more habitable if you're out on a beach like that. But we use the term a little more loosely than that. To us, Mars is habitable. You know, even though there isn't enough, enough air on it for us to breathe, we could live on Mars. It wouldn't be hard to do. We could build Quonset huts that were pressurized, live on or under the surface of Mars. It'd be a little cold. It's a cold desert, but we could live there. That's a very habitable place. Venus is not a habitable place. You know, you're 900 degrees Fahrenheit under, uh, under sulfuric acid clouds. That would not be a habitable place, but Mars certainly is. So habitability basically means having a situation under which water can exist in liquid form for long periods of time to allow any form of life. It doesn't have to be human. It can be microbial, it can be germs, whatever, to be able to exist uh, with the kind of DNA that we have. Well, so far, Earth is the only known site of biology in the universe. I mean, we're looking for other places, but so far, this is it. And I think in order to really do this search properly, you have to search out among the stars. I mean, we are looking in our solar system, and there's a lot of places where we find water, and so the story is not written there yet. So hopefully we'll, we'll find some interesting things out there, but you really need to get out and search among the stars. And you need to, as NASA would say, follow the water and find places where water can exist in liquid form for billions of years. So what this talk is about is finding planets in habitable zones around stars. And in particularly, uh, I want to talk about the nearest stars, because those are the ones that are the most interesting. So you've probably all heard recently in the last year or so about the amazing results coming out of the Kepler mission, which is a NASA mission where they put a telescope in orbit, and they stare at a given place in the sky. And if you go out at night and look at the Milky Way, you'll recognize the, um, the, um, the Northern Cross, or Cygnus, which is uh, this cross right here. Some of you will know where that is in the sky. And the region where, the de where they look is this region right in here. It's an area that has about at least 100,000 stars. And they look at each one of them 24-7 for years on end, looking for signatures of planets crossing the disk of their star, transits. And from that, they can tell how big the orbit of the planet is and, and how common they are. Well, I'm going to differentiate the work that I'm talking about a little bit in terms of setting this into the perspective of where these things are. So here's a view of our Milky Way, and uh, standing from the outside of our Milky Way looking back, and we're sort of down in this area there, and the Kepler project is sort of staring off in this direction, looking out about this far, basically, out into a star field, out sort of in that area like that. So if we look at Kepler's search, they're looking at a, at a cone of stars out in this direction, and most of those stars are two or 3,000 light years away. So the light from them takes two or 3,000 years to reach us. It's pretty nearby as far as our, our galactic neighborhood is concerned, but these are stars that are thousands of light years away. So we're going to zoom in now and look at the region that, that I'm actually uh, looking at, our team has been looking at. Zoom in once, twice, three times, four times, five times, even further. Our hunting grounds are the very nearest stars. These are things that are only 10 or 20 light years away, not thousands of light years away. And within that region, 10 or 20, 30 light years, are hundreds of stars, even thousands of stars that we're looking at to find planets that remind us of Earth. And the technique we use, I don't have time to talk about much today, but basically, we don't see the planets themselves. We see their effect on the star. We see the star being tugged by its planet. When a star is orbited by a planet, it actually, the, both objects are in orbit about each other, about a thing called a barycenter. So the star also has a little orbit that it goes about. It's called a reflex barycentric velocity. 
And when we take a spectrum of a star, we can measure that velocity. We can tell how fast a star is moving towards us or away from us. And over the last 15 years, we've refined our techniques to the point where we can measure the speed of a star to literally about this speed right here, walking speed, basically about a meter a second precision. So we can tell at any time of the year whether a star is strolling towards us or strolling away from us. And when we see a periodic change towards us, away from us, towards us or away from us, we, we know that there's something tugging on that star. It's a planet. The period of that uh, variation gives us the period of the orbit, gives us the size of the orbit. The amount of the variation gives us the, the mass of the planet. And then we can even get the shape of the orbit from all these things. So I'm not going to talk about that at all, but I'm going to tell you that in 15 years, we've gone from knowing no other planets around other stars to knowing over 680 at the present time. Our team has found about half of them. There's a Swiss team that's found probably another 30 or 40 percent, and there's a few other teams in the world that do this kind of work. And we originally used to make diagrams that kind of plotted what these things look like in sort of relative scale with respect to the sun, but you quickly run out of the ability to be able to do that because there's too many of them. But the long and the short of it is that planetary systems are much more diverse than we had guessed. And in particular, I'm not going to talk about that, that diversity. Most of the ones we found originally were like Jupiters and Saturns. These are big gas balls. They were the easiest ones to find early on. But what the real goal was was to find something like Earth, small rocky worlds that are in orbits that actually could support this kind of liquid water. So I'm going to take you to a very quick flyby of an interesting nearby system called Gliese 876. This is one of the first nearby stars that was found to have planets around them, and one of them turns out to be rocky. So here we go. There's a 60-day Jupiter-sized planet orbiting, and there's its 30-day Jupiter-sized orbiting. And about four or five years ago, we found another one tucked in really, really close in about a two-day orbit. And that started to get really interesting, because this thing is not a Jupiter gas ball. This is actually a rock. Unfortunately, it's in so close that it's a hot rock. It's kind of more like a charcoal briquette. So it's not the kind of place you'd expect to live on. But it told us that this kind of star, an M star, about a third of the size of the sun, one of the most common stars in the universe, about 70 or 80 percent of all stars are like this, has these sort of planets around them. So it gave us a lot of hope that we'd, we'd find more, hopefully things that weren't so hot as this. So there's another kind of star that I'm going to talk about right now. Uh, it's another Gliese star, Gliese 581. Gliese was a, uh, a German that made a catalog of all the nearby stars, so he got his name attached to all these things. So you're going to be hearing a lot of Gliese names when we find planets in the future around nearby stars. Gliese 581 in the night sky is in the constellation of Libra. You can't see it with your naked eye, even though it is very nearby, because it is, uh, it, it's too faint, basically. And if we go and look at that star, we find that the, the Geneva team, the Swiss team, detected three planets around that over the last five or so years. So here's a picture of what we call the habitable zone, this plot here. Here's the sun, and kind of to scale are the, are the planets of our solar systems, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. And this zone right here is what we call the habitable zone. And for our solar system, Mars is in the habitable zone, and Earth is certainly in the habitable zone. Venus is kind of on the hot edge. It's not quite habitable, so it's a little too close. And for this system, Gliese 581, there are four planets known around them, detected by this, the Swiss team, uh, Michel Mayor and Stefan Udry. And the first of these was, was C, or, well, was, excuse me, was B. And that wasn't too interesting because it was kind of like a, a, a Neptune, basically. But then C became very interesting because it was so near the habitable zone that everybody thought, well, this is the first habitable rock. Unfortunately, further uh, research and further calculations showed that that wasn't true. And so then they found another one, planet D. But that one also figured, well, OK, that one's habitable. But then it also turned out to be too cold to be habitable. And so we're left with tantalizing things that may be close to habitable zones, but just aren't quite there. One's too hot, one's too cold. So we've been studying the star as well for many years, about 13 years now. And this is kind of a montage of the tool that we've developed to analyze the, the radial velocity data from these things. And I, I don't have time to go through it in detail, but I'm going to show you essentially the, the way we see these planets. What we do is we create what are called periodograms, signals, where we, we look 
at each period in our data, and we ask, how, how well does a sine wave fit that data? And we try each little period, does it fit, does it fit? If it doesn't fit well, you get a small peak. If it fits really well, you get a big peak. So that spike is the signature of a planet with a period of 5.37 days in our data set. So that's the first planet that was found around this system. And then when you remove that and look at the residuals and repeat, you get a, another planet. There's the second planet in the system at 12.9 days. That's 581C. And then the third planet is there. What I'm showing you now as well also are these, these horizontal lines of false alarm. They tell us how sure we are of a signal. So if your peak comes up to that line right there, you have a 10% probability that it's just bogus, that it's not real. This is a 1% probability, and this is a 0.1% probability. So we like our peaks to be up around at least that second line or the third line in order to be pretty sure that it's just not a, a fluke of statistics that we're seeing here. So that's the third planet, 67 days. That was a little trickier because it has aliases, because we can only observe once a day at night, basically. So you get aliases that deal with 1 over 365. And, you, and there's part of the year where you can observe the star, so that also gets you in there as well. And that makes these spurious peaks to the left and the right of the main peak. And so you can't be fooled by those. So you take out the 67-day guy, and you end up with a three-day period left. You fit that thing out, and that was as far as the Swiss could go. But we added all our data to the Swiss data and found two more planets in the system. The next one was at about 433 days. It's that peak right there. And when you fit that out, you're left with a planet at 36.6 days. It meets our criterion of being better than one out of a thousand uh, chances of being just a spurious fluke of the data. So when we put that on our diagram, it falls right in the middle of the habitable zone. So this really caused a lot of interest. We published this a year ago, and it, it made a huge media event. The Swiss immediately attacked it and said it's not real, it's not there, and we got into a big argument over it. And that, that goes on to this day. Um, I'm about to publish another paper that will give them a lesson in statistics, but for right now, for right now, it's, uh, it's still controversial. But here's a here's a top view of uh, of the system, and it's superimposed on our own our own solar system, the inner part of our solar system, to kind of put it to scale. And there's the three day, and there's the five day Neptune basically, and there's the uh, 12.9 day, and then the uh, 36 day the 67-day, and the 433-day guy. So this entire solar system is within the orbit of, Mer of Venus, of our own solar system. It's a tiny little solar system. That's because it's a small star. So everything is kind of scaled down. So that's where it is. So what do we know about this world? Is it a parched, dry desert world? Does it have oceans or continents? Is there a, an atmosphere? with global scale winds and weather. Well, we don't really know about any of these things. What we really do know is that it's a spherical ball of planetary disk stuff with a mass of about three to four times the mass of the Earth. That we know. And when you get that much mass put together, it makes a sphere, it makes a planet. So we know that. But we know a little bit more than that because we have good models of how planetary disk stuff packs under its own gravity. And those models tell us that it has a likely radius of about 30 to 50% bigger than the Earth. So it's a great place to be a realtor. There's lots of real estate on this thing. It's not that much bigger, but it's got more surface area. Now, we also know from its mass and its radius what its surface gravity is. It just goes as m over r squared. And so it has a mass, it has a gravity of about one to two times Earth's gravity. You could walk around on the surface of this thing. You might feel a little tired if it was double your weight. You could still walk around. You might want to sit in a lawn chair for a while. But you'd, 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 if you spend any time on this, you'd get pretty strong. Let's put it that way. It's not known if there is either an atmosphere or water. But we do know that, that things that are much smaller than the Earth, like Mars, don't have enough gravity, really, to hold on to their atmosphere um, so it will boil away. Things that are much larger than about 10 times the size of the Earth very quickly begin to suck in all the other ices that are around them in the planetary disk and grow to become these ice giants like Uranus and Neptune. But things that are smaller than about 10 times the size of the Earth, what we call super-Earths, are just about right to be able to hold on to an atmosphere without pulling in all the rest of the stuff around them. So this is right in that middle category there, which is good. In terms of whether or not there's water, well, we don't really know. 
But we know there's a lot of water in our own solar system. The Earth, of course, has plenty of water. The moon is now known to have water up in its polar regions. Mars, if you look at Mars, even in an amateur telescope, you can see the polar ice caps. Much of that ice is water ice, much of it is carbon dioxide. And now recently, the uh, surveyor missions are finding canyons on Mars that have seasonal flow patterns of things flowing out from under the surface, which are likely to be water. Moving farther out into the solar system, the moon Europa, moon of Jupiter, is covered with basically ice flows that we think are flowing on a, a large subsurface ocean. And even one of the moons of Saturn, even farther out where it's very cold, have these geysers, ice geysers, that have been blowing ice crystals out for millions of years. So water is a very common thing. And it's even common out among the stars. If you look in the Orion Nebula, you'll find with the radio telescopes, there's enough water in the Orion Nebula to fill all the Earth's oceans every 24 minutes. So H2O is very common out there. And this particular system, Gliese uh, 581, has an interesting signature, and that is that the innermost planet didn't form in there. It had to migrate in from in there. It formed out beyond what we call the ice line and migrated in. And that means that all the other pl planets that, that came outside of it weren't swept out of the system, and they came in with it afterwards. So they also formed out beyond the ice line, and they would have brought all those icy volatiles like water and such in with them. So that's a peculiar signature of the system that bodes well for, for water. So there we have it. The other thing about this system is that this planet is tidally locked to its star. If you're to the left of this dotted line here, it means that the, the star has got you in a tidal grip so that you're basically facing, the, the, you're keeping one side facing the, the star all the time, like the moon keeps one side facing the star. And so that has some interesting consequences. And so here's an artist's rendering of the system, Gliese 581G, and you can see the planet itself and some of the other inner planets there. A star is probably a little bit uh, orangier and, and a little bit less intense than the sun. And what I'm trying to show here is there's sort of a hotter region that faces the, the star all the time. There's a cooler region which doesn't show up, I guess, in this thing here. I can hardly see any detail on the back side of this thing. But anyway, it's largely icy over there, and there's polar ice caps on the top and the bottom. And the most comfortable places would be right along the terminator here. And that greeniness there kind of shows you that's where you'd expect life to be. So you have this sort of habitable band around the terminator where you'd be basically an eternal sunset, or if you're an optimist, eternal sunrise, where the star would be right near the edge, of your, right, right near your horizon all the time. This would be a comfortable place to live. The view from there would be spectacular. You'd be able to see the other planets in the solar system. 581E would be about two arc minutes in diameter, about a tenth the size of the full moon. Uh, B, where you'd be able to see phases on it, would be about a third of the size of the full moon. And the star itself, would be quite dramatic, it would be twice the size of our sun in the sky. Even though it's a small star, you're up real close to it, so it'd be pretty big in the sky. Now you can take your speculation even a little farther and think about what you could do on a planet like this. Well, the day side would be great for solar farming, right? You could put vast arrays of, of photovoltaics there and they would always have sunlight and it'd be a wonderful place to generate energy. The dark side, of course, would be perfect for, place, for people like me because you'd be in perpetual darkness and you'd have basically perpetual observing runs. It would always be dark, and you could have incredible views of the universe from there. Any object that you wanted to observe would be up for 18 days, basically, as it came across the sky, and it would always be nighttime there. It would also be an interesting place for SETI to look at, because you have a clock now. You have a, preci a precise alien beacon. So you could imagine if you were aliens living on this thing, and you wanted to let the rest of the universe know that you were there, you could build a set of fixed radio beacons along your, your path there and power them with photovoltaic farms or whatever. And that beacon would go out into space and it would sweep by anyone who would care to listen to it with a very strict period. It would be the orbital period, which is known to five or six figures now, 36.562184 days. So every 36 days, this beacon would sweep by you precisely like a clock. And it's that precise clock ticking that would allow you to see this. Now, of course, if they had two transmitters, one on each side of the terminator, then you'd get the signal every 18 days. So all you need to do is look for signals with periods of integral multiples of that orbital period. And through the power of coherent averaging, you could sit and watch for years. 
And as you slowly over the years began to build up the signal, you'd eventually be able to pull that signal out of the, out of the noise. Well, so what does all this mean? The real, the real, I think the real take-home point of all this is that this discovery happened way too quickly and way too nearby. So if you look at all the nearby stars and you make a map of them, there's 116 stars within 20 light years of, of, of the Earth. This is the distance to Gliese 581. And within that circle, within that volume, there are now two known systems that have habitable Earth-like planets. And if you do some simple statistics on this, one of the systems is, is our own planet, the Earth, the solar system, and the other is Gliese 581. So if you've got these 116 stars, and you have two habitable systems within that sample, you have two out of 116, or 1.7% of stars that have habitable systems, so what we call Eta Earth. But 13% of these will be tipped sort of face on to us and won't be able to see their planets. So we do a slight correction for that, and it's 1.9%. But now it turns out that only nine of these 116 stars have been presently under survey with enough precision to be able to see these kinds of planets. So if you correct for that, you get a number like 25%. So either we've been incredibly lucky in finding a system this nearby this soon, or Eta Earth is at least 25%. I'm not a big believer in luck, so to me, I think it's probably more likely that Eta Earth is 25%. So if you take all the stars in our galaxy and you figure what's 25% of that, the galaxy has to be teeming with over 50 billion of these potentially habitable planets. We know these things have to be out there. So what does the future hold? Do we have starships over Pandora? Uh, well, at this point, it's not looking good. We'll probably need new physics to be able to do something like that. But there was some work that was done back in the late 50s and the early 60s where people decided to see whether they could invent a, a, a rocket ship that could travel among the stars, and there was a thing called Project Orion. And they came up with a thing called a nuclear pulse drive, which is a, basically a rocket ship that can drop nuclear bombs out the back end, and when they explode, they push against a pusher plate, and you have big shock absorbers there, and they drive the spaceship forward. And it turns out doing that, that within a... It, it's not only a very excellent use for all the world's stockpiles of nuclear warheads, as Carl Sagan has pointed out years ago, but you can also get going really fast. You can get up to about a tenth of the speed of light in just a few months doing this. So it'll take you only 44 years to reach the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, or about 200 years to reach the Gliese 581 system. Now, you probably wouldn't send humans because you'd need a big spacecraft with all the lights, life support and everything. There's no need to send humans. Instead, you just send a robotic probe like a droid or something like that. An iPhone would work pretty darn well, but you know, you'd make something a little more intelligent than that, but that would do the job pretty well, actually. You wouldn't need much of a payload. You wouldn't send humans because you already know what they would find when they arrived. What they would find is the mission that left after them and got there ahead of them in a, in a more modern spaceship, right? Because their technology, that, it stops on that spaceship, but the technology doesn't stop on Earth, so there would always be some other mission that would get there ahead of them. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to send humans. That wouldn't be the way to go. So anyway, so you'd send your droid out there. And in 200 years, plus the 20 years it would take for, for the information from the droid to get back, this is what you might expect to find. So as this droid closes in on the Gliese 581 system, it starts sending back these messages, much like you would when you land on the plane and you text back to your your spouse that, you know, you've landed and all that. So 2231, you can imagine this thing landing and sending back its messages. Now, we don't know quite what the communication protocol would be, you know, 220 years from now. So I, I'm only modeling this based on sort of like the kind of communication protocol we use today or my kids would use today on the, on the web. And this is the sort of <laughs> message that would be coming back from there, right? And so there we are. So that brings me to the end of my talk, and I'll end my talk with a, one of my favorite quotes from Carl Sagan that keeps me going on those dark, lonely nights up on the mountaintops. Somewhere, something incredible is waiting to be known. Thanks very much. <laughs>